Hi everyone, thanks for taking the time out. Uh, we have Manish Gupta, who is the founder of Handmade Expressions, uh, which is a fair trade company uh, into its fifth year of existence. Uh, he's here to talk to us about uh, fair trade and a discussion about that. So um, without much ado, Manish Gupta. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time um, to come for this discussion today. Uh, We'll go through a brief agenda. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself. Um, we'll look at the bigger picture of trade in perspective. Um, we'll talk about why fair trade is important. And then we'll get into how does fair trade work, its impact and challenges, and how can we contribute. My name is Manish Gupta. Um, I founded Handmade Expressions. We are a fair trade wholesaler based out of Austin, Texas. I founded the company about four years back, and we currently work with over 5,000 marginalized artisans across India. We'll keep the presentation very um, casual. Feel free to stop me at any time. Um, only two rules. You cannot throw food at me, um, and you can't ask me hard questions. Um, okay. I'll let you guys uh, read through the quote. So, so Dr. King's quote does a really good job at bringing out how interrelated um, different parts of the world are on each other. Um, and we'll go into a brief introduction, or not introduction, a look at why is globalization and trade important. Trade really keeps us going. It brings us the products we need, services, and information. There are a lot of things that we cannot imagine our world without, and most of them have been brought to us through trade. It creates wealth. It develops our skills. So why do we need to question this trade today? What has gone wrong? Everybody can hear me easily, right? In the back, you guys can hear me? So we look at a traditional value chain and some of its assumptions um, that lies. There is consumers that need goods and services. We have businesses and shareholders who strive to provide those services. We have operations and manufacturing um, partners that work with businesses to create those services and products. And then in the end, we have the producers who actually make or produce things. The traditional economics assume that each player in this value chain has equal access to resources, and they can take care of themselves. It doesn't really play out like that in many parts. We as consumers, when we make a demand of cheaper and faster goods, it creates a pressure on the entire value chain. The businesses and shareholders take this pressure and pass it on to operations and manufacturing. And what does manufacturing and operation does? Pass on that pressure to the producers. The producers are at the bottom. They have no way to pass this pressure on. So they continue to get squeezed and squeezed. And this is what we call the race to the bottom. So here is the question. Why does the producers continue to get squeezed? Why can't they say, no, we will not agree to it? I can do a quick role play. Um, can I get any volunteer for a small role play? And um, I have a chocolate. Come on in. I love chocolate. <laughs> okay, I'm say again? I'm Stefan. Can you, can you say no? I'm Stefan. Thanks for uh, participating in our role play. What do you do at Google? I'm a systems engineer. You, you have to speak here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a systems engineer. Awesome. So let's do a hypothetical scenario where Google comes and say, you know, we need to um, 
be more profitable and will go ahead and cut your salary in half without cutting your hours. You do the same work, but we pay you half. What would you do? I'd probably uh, see if I can uh, I don't know, automate my work, make it, uh, make it happen faster, so I spend less time on it. Great, awesome. And you are actually able to do that. So you put half um, the amount of work, but then they increase your workload because they want you here 9 to 8 or 9 to 5, but they continue to cut your salary. And they keep pushing you. What will ultimately happen? Well, I assume at some point I'll just look for another job. <laughs> so you will say no at a certain point of time. And what helps you to say no? Why, why are you in a position that you can say, no, I won't do it? Because I think I, uh, I would be able to find a similar position somewhere else that would pay me uh, the same amount of money that I had previously uh, for my skills. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and Stefano said he'll share the chocolate with all of us at the end of it. <laughs> Thank you. So Stefano said that he will say no to what he thinks are unfair practices because he can find a better job with the skills that he has. So he has the knowledge um, of what is the value of his work. He, has al he knows of alternatives where his work would be valued. He has a support system where he can s say no and, and be OK. Those are all of the things that many producers around the world don't have. They're in extreme poverty. They need to earn every day to bring bread to their family. They don't have any knowledge of what's the value of their work. They do not have alternate options. They are, there is one or two buyers, and if they don't sell their produce or products to them, they have nothing else to do. So these are some of the things that continue to, to push these producers in, in that position. And corporations are not evil. Businesses strive to fulfill our demands. And sometimes our demand for cheaper and faster products can lead to all of these things. And these are the things which actually cause poverty. So here is the big question. Are we responsible for this? Any, any questions so far? OK. So this is where fair trade comes in. We look at the same value chain in a fair trade model. So we have all the same four players. In this chain, consumers make a demand, but they make a conscious demand. Using that, the businesses and shareholders put a demand to their operations and manufacturing practices, but not only they demand products, they set standards. They give them the resources and feedback. Using this, the operating partners provide resources, fair wages, and development opportunities to producers. In return, producers make good products, which are passed along the chain. And ultimately, businesses and shareholders provide these products to consumers, but the only difference is they also do a big part of education. They explain to consumers how their demand, their choices, is making a big difference in the entire value chain. How a conscious demand by a consumer impacts the producer in another country or in another world. So what really is fair trade? It's an alternate trade model. It is not aid. It focuses on how. It focuses on how a product is being made. How are the resources of a country being utilized? What's the social and environmental impact of any of the production activities um, in a community? It's based on respect and partnerships. There's a lot of education and awareness, not only in the consumers, but through the entire chain. Companies understand how does their products are being made, what's the impact 
of a factory that they run in China has on the environment, on the socioeconomic conditions. The farmers are aware of what's the value of their product. There are many producers who make coffee, who, who farmers who produce coffee and they don't know how coffee is being used. There has been a study done where a number of farmers think coffee beans are used as bullets. It's also about taking responsibility. There is no invisible hand out there taking care of everything. It is we who drive the market, and we have to take responsibility of what we demand. I'll let you guys read through some of the values. And these are basic human values. None of them is rocket science. So why are we re going back to them? How did we miss them? Take a quick look at who benefits from fair trade. The producers and farmers. Businesses. Doing good is a strong business. When you take care of your employees, the employees take care of the business. As consumers, we get healthier products, we create a sustainable system, and we get a wholesome feeling. And this is a very basic comparison between com conventional and fair trade. I'll let you guys read through it. The point that I want to stress the most is the last point. In conventional trade, businesses work on fulfilling the bare standard, the minimum standards. And wherever the standards don't exist, there is no bottom. Whereas fair trade businesses, their decisions are based on what is good for people and planet. So why should we care? because it makes our planet sustainable. We cannot continue the race to, bo race to bottom from one place to another, from one set of people to another set of people, from one set of lower standards to another set of lower standards. It is not sustainable for us. We get higher quality products. It preserves culture and art. Also because we are humans, it is our moral responsibility to support fellow human beings. So how does fair trade really work? We see the scenario where there's an individual producer who doesn't have knowledge, cannot, have, cannot access resources, so he is very prone to be exploited. Usually, we've seen farmers or producers group into a cooperative, which is farmer or producer run, and as a group, they can improve their productivity, they can share the risks, they have a lot more resources, they can get access to technology, um, better market their products, and can say no to exploitation. Um, and I'll give you a small example here of how cooperatives really help individual farmers. In the coffee trade, the average value of normal coffee sale is $1.25 a pound. And usually, we buy coffee in, in market for 7 to $12 a pound. So the farmers get about 10% of the, of the cost coffee that we pay. The, if the same coffee, if it can be roasted and sold, the farmers can fetch up to 6 to $7 a pound. Roasting is actually, in terms of time, and in terms of time, it's a much smaller process, but it increases the value of their coffee by three to four folds. So it is important that we get farmers to do more part of the value chain. But it's very hard for individual farmers to afford the coffee roasting equipment, for them to get the technology on how to do that. But if they group into a cooperative, if 100 farmers group together, they can actually buy that equipment. They can get a loan. They can get the technology. And many of the farmers are starting to do that. And it makes a huge difference in their lives. Many times, the, cost of tr the trading cost of coffee is below the cost of production of coffee.
which drives the farmer into further poverty. But doing something like this actually helps them a lot. Here are some of the organizations that um, govern or support uh, fair trade production. So on the left, you see um, two logos. The first one is FLO, and the second one is Transfair USA. These are certifying agencies. They set standards for fair trade produce. And whichever producers or companies qualify for those standards, their product can get this certification. So if you're ever looking for fair trade products, especially produce, you can look for these two symbols. On the right, the two logos, the first one is Fair Trade Federation, and second one, second one is WFTO, which is World Fair Trade Organizations. These are governing organizations. They're not certifiers, but they have a list of uh, business policies and standards. And whichever business qualify for those practices, they get membership in these organizations. So, and you will find these two logos on all the company information on their websites or on the product. It will say they're members of these organizations. So again, these are not uh, product certifications, but they're, they're company memberships. And this is usually available for non-produce company. For example, a clothing company. If, if that organization is a part of Fair Trade Federation, any literature of that company will, will carry that information. So, so far, there is no certification for products other for non for fair trade products other than produce. And I want to go uh, take you guys through a small video which we made in one of the, one of the trips um, to India, and this is Gujarat, the uh, northwest region of India. This is Kutch, northwestern desert region of India. Sukha invited us to this beautiful village and her humble abode. Sukha is a very talented artisan and very well respected in her community. She practices the art of fine mirror work and embroidery. <coughs> in olden times, this kind of fine artwork was used to make dowry textiles to give to the brides. The artwork was thus considered very sacred and was not allowed to use for any commercial purposes. In 2001, a strong earthquake shook this region. Everything was destroyed. Houses, land, vegetation, everything. The only thing that survived was this age-old art. It was then that the art was shared with the world for the first time. Sukha has used the income generated by this art to rebuild her community and support her family. Fair trade support produces around the globe and helps in elevating global poverty. It ensures no child labor and a bright future for artisan's kids. Okay,
Our next destination will be Horka, a nearby village. We will meet Kishore there. He is a natural dye rock printing artisan. So, how many years have you been working? My father was doing it before. My father was doing it before. So, you have been doing it from your birth? Yes. When we came here, many people have been doing it here. After the birth of the birth of the birth, many people have been doing it here. Yes. Yes. यहाँ के यहाँ करीब में बस्ती है पत्थर लाखों कुकमा यहाँ से काफी लोग आते हैं ये काम करने यहाँ ज़्यादातर वो क्या खेतीवाड़ी का ही काम करते थे फिर यहाँ पे ये गांव लगा फिर ये फैक्ट्री वगैरह सब आ गए थे यहाँ पे काफी अच्छी मेहनत ना मिल जाती है काम भी बहुत So are we really making a difference? I'll quickly take you through some of our artisan stories. This is Sukha that you just saw in the video. She is um, from the Kutch region. Um, they had a massive earthquake in 2001. Almost 80% of the community was destroyed. Um, one of the ways they have been able to rebuild their community is through the income that they generate through this art. This is Buri, um, one of our tribal artisans um, in, on the border of Gujarat and Maharashtra. When she joined this cooperative, she was a, she was a widow. And um, in her community, being a widow doesn't give, us, give her a lot of voice um, in community. Being a part of this cooperative, she was able to make a sustainable living, not only for herself, but for her family. And slowly, she gained more respect in her community. And ultimately, she was able to remarry which is um, an achievement for our community. This is a group um, very close to our heart. Um, on the right, you see a picture of um, the founder of Anna Art Cooperative. These guys are um, in a slum area around Delhi. And they were, for years, they have been in jewelry making, but they have always been exploited by local middlemen. Um, and they were being pushed to a point where they were, um, they were, they were about to abandon their art and move to cities and, and find whatever they could get. Um, his daughter, who's in the picture below, um, learned internet. She found us somehow and wrote, her, wrote us an email saying we really need some support. And we had no idea who they were. We had um, our, our team in India actually found them, went to see them, and realized that they are a great set of people. They, they have amazing art. We were able to uh, work with them, create a line, that is really successful for us now. And we are proud that we are able to give them good employment. And, and now the whole community is booming. They are able to involve the entire community. And we can slowly see a progression where slowly they become economic self-sufficient. Then they are able to open up to send their children to more schools. So there is a whole progression that happens over a period of years just because there is economic self-sufficiency. These are pictures of some of our artisans in, in um, northern India. And this cooperative supports many women who have escaped child marriages or abusive marriages. This cooperative gives them a safe home, teaches them vocational skills, and gives them independence. These are some of the development projects that, that we are involved in. But there are a lot of challenges for fair trade. There is very limited consumer education. Sometimes doing things the right way doesn't make them the cheapest, which is a big challenge. Also, there is a lot of fair trade washing. Consumers have to differentiate between what is marketing and what is mission. And I can give you guys a simple example. There's a company that says if you buy a red car or a red cell phone, we give a certain amount of dollar to a certain charity in Africa. And a lot of time, people think that is a responsible company. But we don't question how is the product being made? What are the core practices of that community? Are the switch, are the, is that cell phone being made in a sweatshop? So that is 
as consumers, we have to understand whether a company is doing something good for the marketing part of it, or is the core principle of the company looking to make sure they are respectful of people and our environment. There is a lot of lack of resources within fair trade businesses, within producers. There is lack of materials, training, and logistics. And it is not convenient to adopt fair trade. We as consumers, if I want to go and buy a fair trade pair of shoe, there is not much available. I have to wear a Nike athletic shoe because there is no other option. So it's not easy for us to adopt fair trade even if we want to. So how can you help? And the most important thing is educating ourselves, understanding the purpose of fair trade and why it is important. Educating and promoting in our community, be it in fellow Googlers, be in your faith group, be it your family or friends. Supporting fair trade products wherever possible. It could be as small as fair trade coffee in the Google Cafe. There can be small steps that we can all take to slowly make a difference by volunteering or working with fair trade companies. These are some of the, some of the fair trade products now available. Every day there are more and more and better fair trade products being available. Some facts and figures. It is one of the fastest growing market segments, so it is a good business model. And majority of crafts are made by women. Here are some of the resources um, to learn more about fair trade. Also, these um, resources will tell us places where to buy fair trade products from. And the choice is ultimately ours. Questions, simple ones. I'm joking, please. Do you have much experience outside of like a skilled craft, craftsperson or artist in how to help people that are working in a factory or that type of situation to improve their situation? My personal experience? Were you asking if I, if I personally have experience? Um, either or just information. I mean, this one thing that, like you said, it's very difficult to know. Like right now, it's very difficult for me to know where the things I buy come from and to make a choice. You know, something might cost more, but that doesn't mean the people that produced it were paid more. Um, so I'm just curious if you have any knowledge or experience with. And, and thank you. That's, that's a great question. Um, it is very hard right now. Um, to really understand where your product is coming for, from or, and how it is made. The, the most important, I think, turning point at this, at this stage is to ask, to ask the producers um, and to ask your local store. If you, if you do grocery at Safeway, sometime ask them, hey, is your coffee, coffee producer, do you know if they were paid a fair wage? Do you know there was no child labor involved? The, the more you ask your local stores, they will ask their producers. And it will make a difference. It is, as I said, consumers drive the market, the practices and the standards. So the more we go and ask, the more it makes a difference. I have a really good example. Um, I recently gave a talk in Norman, um, Oklahoma. They're trying to make it a fair trade town. And one of the professors, um, they have a school for uh, peace and justice. and she actually gave a project to her class to, to go to a coffee shop um, in their area, which was a popular cafe in, in, in the university, and ask them about fair trade coffee and if they offered fair trade coffee. In a month, about 10 to 20 people went and asked the manager, do you serve fair trade coffee? Do you know where your coffee comes from? The manager had no choice but to look up. He was, he was very curious. He didn't know what fair trade was. He looked up fair trade coffee. And he's, he was a strong believer that he wants to serve good coffee. That was his first parameter. He learned there are fair trade coffee vendors in the city. He actually tried that coffee and figured out that coffee was better coffee than the coffee he was serving. He brought that in. Now he serves 100% fair trade coffee. People go there to that cafe just because they serve fair trade coffee. And the manager is happy there is more business. People are happy they get better coffee and they can drink it with proud. 
they know that coffee does not involve fair, uh, child labor. So asking is, is the biggest thing. Um, and not to say an example, I wanted to get the chocolate I bought, I wanted to get a fair trade chocolate. And I was, California being California, I, w I was under the assumption that every big grocery store will have fair trade chocolates. That was not true. And it is not a critic, but the fact that if in California, where their most conscious people in the country are not demanding fair trade products, then we have a lot of work to do. Does that help? And a lot of times, going to companies' websites will give you a lot of information. A lot of companies will, will have a lot of claim of social responsibility, but when you ask for details or go on their website, you will find nothing. So many times, just sending, a, giving a feedback on their website, saying, we need to understand where your products are coming from. A lot of big companies have made changes after there has been um, communities and nonprofits who have started um, um, big organizations or, or, or activism to, to not do certain things. Nike has made a lot of change. A lot of oil companies have lot, made a lot of change after people have asked them. It makes a big difference. So are there any uh, exemptions given by countries for fair trade goods to, uh, for, um, what do you call it, import and export duties, et cetera? So if I'm trying to import fair trade coffee from Brazil, say, into the USA, are there any uh, discounts or exemptions on import and export duties? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, if anything, it'll be harder. Um, fair trade um, market is such, or fair trade trading is so small right now that it is not even scratching the surface. Um, the, the biggest importer of fair trade coffee in US is Starbucks. And within Starbucks, 1% of their coffee is fair trade. So it is minuscule amount. And the governments are, the governments of the country cannot, um, there is such strong lobby of non fair trade organizations that the governments of poor countries can't afford to take a stand against conventional trade. So we have a long way to go before um, there can be incentives for, for fair trade at a, at a government level. This actually touches on what you just said about uh, poor countries, because um, I, I'm originally from Romania. And uh, I doubt fair trade would have a very large adoption rate over there, because when you have uh, quite a small salary every month, what you're looking for is buying the most of what you need, not necessarily seeing that that's going to benefit other people. So um, having said that, um, I currently live in Switzerland, where there's a huge emphasis on buying local home or natively made products, uh, which means things like ranging from steaks to uh, local made shoes to locally made clothes uh, are given preference both by the customers and by the stores, uh, which make a big, big selling point out of the fact that this has been made in Switzerland. Uh, everywhere you look, you'll see labels that saying Swiss made. Uh, and so I think that plays a, a big role in, uh, in helping the local producers. So I think while fair trade is a good start, uh, in, in the end, you, to keep this sustainable, it helps a lot more if the people in the country that this is, this, these products are being are made in would actually uh, buy them themselves and give them preference over things made in a factory that you know, employs children or that just makes a thousand of them very low quality. Absolutely. Local, local goes hand in hand. Um, local has the same values as fair trade. Um, if there is something which is available local, you don't have to buy it from outside, absolutely. Um, buying things from outside has a much bigger environmental impact. The carbon footprint is really high. And when you buy things made local, you are, strength I'm sorry, you are strengthening your own community, which makes it powerful, which makes it do better and bigger things. So absolutely. Thank you. So no questions means, is everybody agreeing to we need fair trade? Thank you for coming. This was great. Um, I just ran across an interesting counterpoint to this. I want to hear how you responded, which is 
the idea that if a store offers a fair trade item at a higher price than the conventional item, then it creates more market segmentation, which would drive down the price of the, the standard item, which would reduce the living, quality of living of the people producing that lower quality product and potentially just transfer the, uh, the wealth from one set of poor people to another set of poor people, not really changing the net. So how would you respond to that position? Thank you. That, that's a really good question. Um, it is, you are true, um, you are correct that if we think that fated product is premium than non-fated product, we devalue the non-fated product and it can potentially drive down the price. But at the same time, we are hoping that as fair trade demand increases, more and more people will be, more and more producers will form their cooperatives and move over to the fair trade segment. So though there is less demand of non fated products, the demand for fated products will increase. And slowly, the producers will shift from this part to that part. And we have to go through this, cha this change in process before we can completely move all producers in the fair trade section. So we have to go through that cycle. But the faster we make a transformation, the more and more people support fair trade practices, easier that transformation will be. And hopefully companies, when, when you see d more demand of fair trade products, corporations will get inspired to change their practices. And it doesn't, companies don't have to change their sourcing partners. They can work with the same factories. They can work with the same producers, but do it better. Make sure that the, the farmers in their, in their factories are, I'm sorry, the producers in their pr factories are given better conditions. And it is, it, is, it is a hard step, but every company who's tasted that has seen a strong inspiration in its producers, in its employees. And when they communicate it well, the market responds to it. So I'm hoping that there's a time when people can think, yes, fated product is better. That will be a great step. And fair trade is not against capitalism. Fair trade is not against efficiency. Fair trade wants to make sure that there are environmental and social boundaries. It, is, it wants to make sure that the group of marginalized people who cannot protect their own rights are given a platform where they can, where they can engage in global trade equally. Oh, no. Have you been involved at all with things like government legislation to actually help? Because it seems like also that there are people who will buy the cheapest thing regardless of what they know about how it was made. And at some level of all the people wanting to make money, it might come down to someone saying it's not legal to do the things that the, are being done. So is that something you've been involved in? No. Um, we, have, we are... Honestly, at this point, we as an organization, um, we don't think we can be very effective at that as individuals. So for me, I've taken uh, my journey as to support a set of producers and to create awareness in the North American consumer market. But there are a lot of organizations who are, who are doing that, and we support them in many ways. Um, there are fair trade coalitions in most chapters. Um, there is also a big coalition of sweat free um, apparel, which is, um, which is big in California, actually. So there are um, many organizations who are um, working on the government level to, to make a difference or to set basic standards of um, operation in their factories. A, a good, um, just to add to it, a good resource for, um, for making changes at that level would be um, Global Exchange. It's a nonprofit based in San Francisco. And they've done a lot of work on, on government lobbying and activism in, in fair trade. So if you go to globalexchange.org, you'll find that information. They also have an online fair trade store and three brick and mortar fair trade stores in, in Northern California. Um, do you think uh, fair trade and um, the drive to basically, uh, the, the drive to basically consume less and the fact that it almost seems to me like the current system is basically driven towards volume, wherein you basically 
the amount economies of scale comes into comes a lot into the picture where you basically want to produce more and more and i guess to me it seems almost like fair trade would be almost uh, do really well in a market where there's less to basically consume overall and it's almost like okay if you basically start do less wastage consume less consume more it almost kind of seems to go that way so my kind of question is does this kind of so what about all the people who are in that supply chain who basically kind of live off of the existing system and it's almost like it's can go either way in terms of uh, the impact of going towards a fair trade kind of model um you're right in your observation that it is fair trade has been more successful in more niche markets um because for a niche product people put more attention on what they're buying uh and people are willing to to pay more um for a product the the downside is that majority of producers and farmers are involved in commodities so even if we have niche markets that are serving fair trade products it will not make a big difference on producers and farmers so and the second downside is that every time you you make something on a bigger level there will be dilution so as more and more organization participate in fair trade fair trade standards will become lower um we cannot change that that is a law of nature um but the only way to to make a bigger impact and to reach most people we have to um accept or acknowledge fair trade in in commodities and it will happen slowly um one of the things one of the another reason of working um for fair trade in commodity is that it touches more consumers um most people know about fair trade just because fair trade coffee is very popular it is it is one product that many people um buy every day it is easy to support and it makes a big difference so niche markets can only sometimes reach niche audience which is what is happening in crafts um products ap- apart from produce um there it could be it could be clothing it could be bags it could be stationery they are they've become a specialty market there are stores that sell fair trade products but they are not serving the masses um not many people know about it not many people support them because there is lack of education so we cannot ignore the masses and 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 make a difference in a very small market it will it will not be enough and another thing that is happening is because people have started to care more about where the product is coming from there is a huge amount of marketing focus um we call it fair trade washing and hopefully many companies are changing their practices but there is every product that you that you see in the market now has a claim of sustainability if you buy a detergent it is helping somebody if you buy a you know a can of salt it has a pink ribbon on it so it is also more important at this time that we start the education process otherwise every company will have a small claim of social responsibility and for consumers that is good enough does that answer your question so again i want to thank you all um for coming and for the discussion um i'll be around for some time if anybody has any questions i'll be happy to to give my contact information i want to thank prachi um and pranay for um arranging this discussion um if there's anything i can um do to to answer any questions i'll be happy to do that thank you